Chapter 6. The Truth of the Matter Tis better to be alone than in bad company. Hello, my name is Scootaloo, and you probably know me, since I'm pretty famous, for my awesome performances at events like last year's Gallops, or maybe just the founder of the Red Racer. None of which means a damn anymore, of course. If you're hearing this, that means Omega Level Threat Protocols have been enhanced. And you are... are now... Ah, damn it. Sorry. Okay, right now, I'm talking to you as Vice President of Stable Tech. You have been appointed as Overmare, or, in the case of Stable 24, Overstallion, of a Stable Tech life-preserving stable. You have been chosen for your sense of loyalty and duty, both to the ponies around you and to this company. And while the Stable Tech HQ might be, probably is, nothing but blasted rubble now, our ideals live on. Your stable has been selected to participate in a vital social project. The first goal of your stable, like all others, is to save the lives of the ponies inside. But you also have a higher purpose beyond saving the lives of individual ponies. We here at Stable Tech understand that it doesn't do ponykind any good to save ourselves now only to annihilate each other later. We must figure out where we went wrong. We must find a better way. And we must be ready to implement it as soon as possible once the stable doors open and survive what our current leaders have managed to do to Equestria. Damn it! I really hope no pony has to hear this. Can't this all just be for nothing? Uh, they're going to destroy us all, aren't they? I'm sorry. Again, totally off script. Where was I? Oh yeah. In short, Stable Tech is working to ensure that a more... a more... stable society for future generations. Inside the safe in your office, you will find special instructions and objectives, as well as details on how your specific stable has been filled and fitted to carry out your part. If at any point you believe that your part of the project is threatening the safety and security of the ponies in your charge as a whole, you are to cease participation and take any necessary steps to rectify the situation. In any other circumstances, however, it is crucial that you keep to the directives provided and keep stable tech appraised for all results as per your sealed instructions. Thank you from all of us from all of Equestria. Thank you, and may some pony up there have pity on us all. Not the message I had been expecting. Now my feelings about the stables were completely twisted in my head, and I just wanted to forget them entirely. Away with the old, embrace the new, right? I clopped my hoof on the counter again. Apple whiskey, another of your specials, please. Apple Whiskey, the bartending unicorn who owned and ran Turnpike Cavern, told, poured me another glass. Then, as I watched, he lined up seven apples on the counter. Beautiful golden apples, quite unlike the pale and flavorless ones back at Not Home, and waves his horn over them, magically transforming them one by one into bottles of the most delicious, pain-numbing, mind-easing fermented apple beverage. Beside me, Calamity drop, clops his hooves on the floor in applause, and several mares in the tavern let up a whoop. Don't know why I was surprised, I half whispered, leaning over near Calamity. Your leader is a stallion, after all. Calamity's ears perked up, and he gave me a look of shocked confusion. My leader? I don't have a leader. I couldn't tell whether he sounded more offended or worried. I hoof waved. I heard him over the sprite box when it wasn't being watcher. Calamity looked at me with a deeper confusion and then broke out into a 
Two riotous laugh. <laughs> what? Red Eye? He turned the rest of the bar. He turned to the rest of the bar. Hey everyone, Lil Piff here thought Red Eye was our leader. The whole tavern joined in on the laughter. Goodness, girl, one cried from the counter down at us. Red Eye ain't nothing but a puffed up prancer. Hell, I don't even listen to that broadcast. Not when the DJ's on the dial. Huh? Yep, agreed a buck from the nearby table as he gathered a pile of bottle caps from his cross-looking companions, many of whom were looking at colorful squares in disgust. Just little Red Eye try and come down here and make New Appaloosa part of his so-called New World. I'll personally take all his unity and brotherhood and shove it right up his ass. Just deal, the pony next to him interrupted grumpily. So, I fought to shove new facts into the puzzle I was building in my head. The drinks were great for forgetting, but not so great for thinking. The not-watcher voice in the sprite bite is Red Eye, and he's not your leader? What's this watcher stuff? The mayor closest to me asked. The sprite bites are just radios. Red Eye can't actually watch ponies through them. They ain't cameras. She turned to Calamity. I mean, could you imagine if he could? Okay, now that I knew wasn't true. But apparently, the fact those sprite bots can be used to spy wasn't common knowledge. Watcher had tipped me off to something. One of the bucks from down the counter called out, Hey, Apple Whiskey, put DJ on! Apple Whiskey looked up to a brown box on the top of the shelves, which had wires running down to speakers throughout Turnback Tavern. With a slight glow of his horn, the radio turned on, and a beautiful mare's voice, probably the sweetest I'd ever heard, or at least a close second to Velvet Remedies, began to pour out of the speakers. How did this happen? What have I done? I was only trying to help, but I caused so much pain. I wish I could hide. I wish I could run. I wish I could find a way to do it all over again. The voice and the song she sang was so solemn and sad and filled with determination that I made my mind go to unhappy places. I soon felt like crying and had to force myself not to. I figured more drink would help, so I finished mine and clopped for another. I lost sight of the war while fighting my battles, and now I carried the weight of the world on my saddle. Oh, this was unbearable. My heart was breaking, and I wasn't even sure why. I grabbed at a distraction. DJ? Who is DJ? The answers came fast, almost too fast to keep up with. It seemed every pony in the tavern had something to say. DJ Pwn 3, of course. There's always a DJ Pwn 3. Best magic music in all of the equestrian wasteland. Yeah, all, what, 12 songs? 20? He's a ghoul pony, been around forever. No, he's not. They keep changing. Back when I was a filly, DJ was a mare. I heard he's a pegasus. He's got a stallion, or a station up in the clouds. That's how he knows what's going on. That's stupid. Every pony knows that DJ Pwn 3's station is at a ten pony tower in the Manhattan ruins. He is too a ghoul pony. He's been around since before the war. I heard the original DJ Pwn 3 was actually a mare named Vinyl Scratch, who was killed, or who was killed when the zebra Balefire wiped Manhattan. But her nephew was spared, being in Ten Pony and all, and took up the mantle. I heard it was her sister. My head was spinning. Calamity was smirking at me, leaning close, and he whined. There's always a DJ Pwn 3. And, in the background, the voice of seemingly infinite beauty and sadness cried out, How can I fix this? How many times must I try? Please, this time, let me get it right. The music died away, and a voice came over the radio. This is DJ Pwn 3, and that was Sweetie Belle, singing about the one great truth of the wasteland. 
Every pony has done something they regret. And now, my little ponies, this time for the news. Now you ponies remember, I told you about those two ponies who crawled themselves out of stable two? Well, I've been getting reports that one of those little ponies took out the raider's nest in the heart of Ponyville and saved several pony captives, including the beloved author of the Wasteland Survival Guide, Ditsy Doo. Hey kid, thanks from all of us. And now the weather. Cloudy everywhere with a chance of rain, gunfire, and bloody dismemberment. I didn't really hear the rest. I was too stunned. I was on the radio. DJ Pone 3 was talking about me. My heart mixed with pride and panic, the latter quickly swallowing the former. I'd been outside less than a week, and I already had a reputation that was spreading across all of the equestrian wasteland. A reputation that was built me up into some pony far more heroic and capable than I actually was. One last thing. The other stable dweller was last seen out near Appaloosa. My prayers go out there for that one. And that's the truth of the matter. Now, back to the music. Here's Sapphire Shores singing, How Can the Sun Can't Hide Forever? From your lips to Celestia's ears. Sapphire. For a moment, everything seemed to stop. What? I turned to Calamity. Near Appaloosa? I thought this was Appaloosa. Calamity snickered, still not done having fun with me over my wasted ignorance. No way, little Pip. This here's new Appaloosa. You can't have a new without having an old. Now can you? Then he quickly got serious. Now, you don't want to be going anywhere near old Appaloosa, you hear me? That's a slaver town. Apple Whiskey interrupted. Well, there's no harm going up that way to trade. And sell a good bit of my trademark Apple Whiskey to these folk. I was stunned. Surely he was kidding. You trade with slaver ponies? Yep, in fact, I got a train heading out that way on the morrow. I looked at him, in disbelief. You trade with slavers. Calamity whispered in my ear. Why you think I never took up living here? It wasn't a question. The next morning, I found myself out on the corner of a continuing downpour, staring at the train and feeling not a little guilty that I spent the last evening helping load the flat cars as part of my training with Crane. That evening would have gone a bit differently had I known where these goods were heading. I can't talk, with, talk you out of this, can I? Clamity stood next to me, checking the loads on his battle harness. My head was thudding dully, the aftermath of too much apple whiskey. But I was thinking clearly. I knew this was foolish. But where there were slavers, there were slaves in need of rescue. A new part of me was just trying to live up to my own overblown reputation. But I'd also been a captive of slavers, if only for a few hours. And I couldn't just ignore the fact that there were ponies up there who needed some pony to care enough to try and help them. No. Well, then I'm a coming with you. I've always wanted to take a shot at that damn place. Figure if there's two of us, might actually have a chance. His words left me feeling immensely relieved. I'll talk to Ditsy Doo for supplies. Don't want neither of us to run out of ammo up there, or food. We can take the train up the mountains and over the desert, but chances are we'll be trotting back. I mulled that over and suddenly realized that even if we had our own supplies, what about any ponies we rescued? And would they be in any state to make it through that kind of trip? Not that such a question deterred me at all, but I'd have to find a way to talk the ponies pulling the train to wait for us, as we robbed the town they were trading with, no less. I voiced my concern to Calamity. You're going to have to do some fast talking if you want to convince them or anything like that, 
he replied. Then seemed to have an idea. I know some pony in town that just might have what you need to pull that off. Calamity trotted off, leaving me staring at the train once again. While I waited, I tried to familiarize myself with the train. Flat cars and box cars held supplies. Passenger cars, of which this train had only one, were for carrying ponies. The fancy red car on the back and the big bronze one with the smokestack which rode at the front were mysteries. I knew nothing of the former, and the latter I only recognized from a similar train car in the hodgepodge construction of absolutely everything. Curious, I asked one of the polar ponies what those cars were for. He was happy to answer. Leather back one is called a caboose. He pointed a hoof towards the red car in the rear. That has the brakes. You see, when we go up mountain, we have to keep switching out polar teams, because that there's hard work. One team pulls, one team rides, and keeps a look out for raiders. But when we go down the mountain, every pony rides. Then we use the brakes to keep us from going too fast. Now, he pointed at one at the front. That one's called an engine. It's for pulling the train, although mostly we just use it for the whistle. It keeps varmints off the track. Huh? For pulling the train? I thought you box pulled the train. Yep, we do. Then, well, because the engine don't work without coal. Ain't got no coal. Ain't got no coal car, even if we had it. So instead, we use pony power. That didn't make any sense. So the engine is to pull the train, but the engine can't pull the train. So you all have to pull the train and the engine. I had to be missing something. Yep. Uh, okay. And then, why don't you have any coal? Where's the coal? The train pony rolled his eyes at me. Oh, there ain't no coal in Equestria. I felt something in my head snapping. All the coals in a far, far away land. Then, how was the coal supposed to get here? By train, of course. Ah, that was it. I needed to stop learning about trains. They hurt my brain. This conversation had more, had made the pounding in my head much, much worse. Splashing through puddles, Calamity trotted back. After the train pony had gone back to his work, Clemity reared up and waved his fore hooves around, making a mock spooky face. Ooh! All the coals in strange, faraway lands, full of zebras, ooh! I stared at him, nonplussed. Done now? He dropped back to standing and pulled a tin out of his saddlebags, offering it to me in his teeth. I levitated it close for a look. The tin had a scratched out picture of a zebra on it. Those there are in... are called party time mintals. Brewed up using mintal and, well, some other stuff. Guaranteed to make you the laugh of the party. Those things will clear up your hangovers, clear your head, and make you the smoothest talking pony in all the wasteland. I looked doubtful. But then, I trusted Calamity, and what did I have to lose? Telekinetically opening the tin, I pulled out one of the little squares inside and put it in my mouth, chewing experimentally. I had to admit, they were tasty, although the aftertaste was kind of bitter. But I don't feel any different than I... WHOA! The whole world shot into stark focus. Colors became brighter and more pleasant. Even the rain seemed nicer. And my th thoughts, I was thinking more clearly than I ever had. I was figuring things out I never could before. By Celestia, where had this wonderful stuff been all my life? I felt confident. Figuring out just what I needed to say was going to be easy. I could talk any pony into anything. And I was about to prove it. 
Hours later, I stared out the window of the passenger car, watching the landscape roll by. Or at least as much as I could see, considering the sky had darkened and the rainfall had escalated again. Remembering rivulets running down the cliff face near Step 24, I prayed the storm wouldn't cause us trouble when going up the mountain. Talking the train ponies into waiting for us had been easy. Making up for the crash when that part-time mental wore off, leaving me feel feeling half blind and horribly stupid without its help. It was all I could do to not eat another one right away. In fact, I would have done so if Calamity had been snatched the tin away. Even now, I cast fruitive glances at his saddlebags. Ugh, think of something else. I tried tuning into the DJ Pwn3 station. It was barely audible through the haze of static. New Appaloosa, I figured, was near the edge of good reception. I tried another station on my pit buck and found the music of the sprite bots. Calamity told me to turn it off. Staring out of the window again, I found my mind drifting until I settled on. Of all things, did he do? I was wearing my utility barding, now upgraded to be effective armor thanks to the strange but cheerful Pegasus Ghoul. That poor pony, I thought. Seeing her home obliterated, and then turned into a rotting mockery of the normal pony, and made to live with the memory of that for centuries. Raiders, slavers. She suffered at the hooves of both of them, actually seeing things that horrified me to contemplate. And as if that wasn't enough, she's a ghoul pony. It was as if she had a magical sword hanging over her brain waiting to drop. It was amazing that she wasn't a broken wreck of a pony, and I remember her smile, wondering how she could be happy. And then I got it. Clemity asked, what well, got you all smiling like that all of a sudden? I chuckled at myself, shaking my head. Laughter is a virtue. What now? I smiled, holding back a laugh of my own. Maybe not giggle giggle laughter, and definitely not <laughs> laughter, but the kind of inside laughter that allows a pony to take everything in the world that throws at her and not lose joy. Maybe it was a little stretch to call that laughter, but it definitely was a virtue. I turned back to the window, my own spirits somehow higher than they have been in days. Lightning flashed outside, and I gasped, jumping back from the window. I could have sworn I saw the head of a giant pink pony, the size of an Ursa Major, peering at me over the hilltop, grinning. You ready? Calamity shouted through the door downpour. The train was approaching Appaloosa, old Appaloosa. Calamity and I were standing in the rain-slicked roof of the passenger car wind whipping rain in our faces and pulling at our manes and tails. I nodded. Rubbing his forelegs around me, Clemity stretched out his wings and caught the wind. The storm snatched us up off the train, and Clamity began to steer us towards a ridge that overlooked the slaver town. The wind buffeted us, making me fearful that we would crash, but Clamity's course stayed true. We landed, then I immediately skipped, slipped, and fell in the mud. Calamity barked a laugh, and I shook really hard, flinging at least half the mud onto him, and then I laughed too. But then we stopped. Laughter or not, there was a time and a place for our laughter, and this wasn't it. I floated my binoculars over to Calamity and then pulled out the sniper rifle to peer down its scope at the collection of dilapidated wooden buildings, derailed boxcars, makeshift metal structures, and slave cages that made up old Appaloosa. The train was just pulling in.
between the darkness of the storm and the distraction the tra of the train, there would never be a better time to sneak in. Through the sniper scope, I could make out the silhouettes of guards walking along catwalks that ran between the building and above the cages. In the cages, I could see the slave ponies laying under the pouring rain, forlorn shapes in the storm. I felt a familiar pissedness taking hold. Calamity, you stay up here. I'm heading down. I didn't come all this way to stay back. I levitated the sniper rifle to him. You're my cover. And my quick exit if things go bad. Unless you think you'd be better at picking those locks, and I'd be better at flying you out. He clearly wasn't happy, but conceded my point. Pulling out little Macintosh, I checked to make sure it was loaded, and I started down the slippery ridge. I didn't want to have to use that gun. Not that I was feeling particularly live and let live about slavers. It was just that, of all the things little Macintosh was, it wasn't quiet. I was most of the way to the first set of cages when a flash of lightning illuminated the landscape starkly. If it hadn't, I would have been dead moments later. As it was, I was merely screwed. Mines. All around the cages, the fucking slavers had scattered mines. Rain had washed away the dirt covering them, and the orange metal casks reflected the flash of light. There were surely more, but I had no idea how many. Or where. After my session with Crane, I was much better at self-levitation. But that only got me to the fence. I was far less confident that I had the power to levitate all the slaves to safety. Hey, who's there? A voice out in the darkness. A slaver pony. I wasn't the only pony to have seen something in that flash of light. Damn it. I scooted, moving as stealthily as I could. I hated to leave the slave pens, but I needed more time. If I shot, I'd bring the whole place down on me, and if I tried to take out a slave pony with my hooves, I knew he'd be able to cut, call for help, before I took him down. So instead, I decided to hide, slipping into the nearest shack. I immediately regretted it. The shack was only a few rooms, and from the one upstairs, I could hear what I really hoped was two slaver ponies going at it. I felt both embarrassed and disgusted. Trying not to make a sound, I looked around for a place to hide. I didn't want to be standing right inside the door if that guard pony decided to peek and see the shack. I also started peeking into boxes. I knew this was stealing, not just scavenging. But these ponies stole all their ponies, so I didn't figure they had any standing to complain. With screwdriver and bobby pin, I didn't even spare the lockbox I found in the next room. Sitting inside, I found something unique. A little totem. A statuette of an orange pony with a yellow mane and tail poised in mid-buck. What struck me was a three-apple cutie mark, identical to the mark on Little Macintosh. I floated it close to read the inscription on the base. Be strong, and felt a surge of magical energy. I'm not sure what it did, but I actually felt stronger. Not just physically, but in confidence. Slipping the statuette into my saddlebags, I finished my looting, and the door barged open. There you are! I whipped around, sliding into the comfort of sats, and fired two shots into the pony, one in the head and one in the chest, before he could reach me to pummel me with his spike-shod hooves. The sound carried. Immediately, two ponies above stopped their intercourse and came charging down the stairs. Only one of them had stopped to grab a firearm. Blam, blam, blam. Little Macintosh roared, roared like thunder. The slave opponent with a gun never even had a shot. I reloaded as quickly as I could. Luna, damn it. 
Well, I was in it now. Fire blasted past me as I dove behind a rock. A flamethrower. This fucker is attacking me with a flamethrower. Oh, I smell roasted pony for dinner, snarled the slaver with a flamethrower battle saddle. How about a little barbecue? I was seriously hoping he was just being awful, and that these ponies weren't so depraved as to actually eat other ponies. Lightning flashed, thunder boomed above me, and I ran for cover behind a crazily tilted boxcar. Flame whooshed out behind me, catching my tail. With a yelp, I thrashed at a nearby puddle until the flames disappeared. Ow, ow, ow. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Cringing back, I brought out the combat shotgun. Little Macintosh had finally ran out of bullets five dead slavers ago. Two of those had been unicorn slavers wielding shotguns. And now, I was in no danger of running out of shotgun shells anytime soon. The flamer slaver stepped around the corner and got a face full. He went down hard. Swiftly, I took what I wanted from the body, leaving the battle saddle behind. I had neither the neutral or natural aptitude nor the professional skill to use a battle saddle, and I didn't need that kind of weight slowing me down. I looked around nervously for more attackers. Including the pony with a flamethrower and the three back in the first shack, I put down a total of nine slavers. Not a lot, but by no means a town's worth. I was surprised that all the gunfire wasn't drawing a lot more attention. The thunderstorm might actually account for much of that, and these guys seemed to have a level of st stupefying ego that prevented them from just running to get more help. But there had to be more at play than just dumb luck. Dumber slavers, and the weather. Battling the slaver guards was pushing me closer to the huge multi-story barn at the heart of town. There was a lot of light pouring out from the windows, and a lot of noise. As I drew closer, I could hear music. And I checked my pit buck, but old Appaloosa appeared out of range of every radio station, except one. The Spritebot station. How that station covered every place, I had no idea. Although I suspected the Sprite Bot themselves might actually be acting as relays too. This music, however, was not that music. Going in the front door would have surely been a death trap. But creeping up the catwalks to the second floor, entrance proved safe. And I tried to slip, slip in quietly, but the moment I cracked the door open, the wind flung it wide with a crash. I cringed then poked my head inside the room. The room was empty. Of ponies, at least. It was crammed with broken furniture, old filing cabinets, bottle caps, ammos, and packages of cigarettes were in several of the cabinets. They found a new home in my saddlebags. I didn't smoke, and I had no intention of starting to, but I could sell the packs to Ditsy Do, who would resell them to the surprising number of Appaloosians who did. The door towards the far end of the balcony. From there, I could see the manticore's share of the room. It was a wide open saloon packed with ponies who were drinking, gambling, and watching the performance on the stage directly below me. The balcony rigged the saloon, and there were guard ponies walking around them in a pattern. They were focusing on the chaos below and hadn't spotted me. Yet. Wait, I... I recognize that voice. Crouching flat on the balcony, I poked my head over the edge to see the singer. Velvet Remedy! Footnote. Level up. New perk. Mighty to telekinesis. Level 2. You triple the match you can levitate with your unicorn magic. Effects are cumulative with Mighty Telekinesis, level 1 which was required in order to take this perk.